thank you, Maggie. And uh, I would like to thanks, uh, thank for the uh, invitation here. And I was here actually, I think, two years ago, the, the first time. So this time I was told that I should keep it really short, around 15 minutes. So I will just uh, focus on, on main things. And I will just start with a definition. I mean, what is motility and why is it important? So if you look at uh, big studies, uh, it says that around 70 to 80 pa uh, 80 percent of patients with scleroderma will have some kind of problems with gastrointestinal motility. Most commonly, it is uh, the esophageal motility. That means problems with uh, swallowing. So motility, basically, when we define it, it's a movement of the digestive tract, and it's this coordination or coordinated transit of the contents within it. And there are several components in it. So you need, you need muscle, basically, which is producing the strength of the contraction, and then nerves which, that are coordinating all this action. And if one or the other of these components or both are affected, uh, the person will develop uh, problems with motility or dysmotility. And this is just a kind of a scheme what you can find in the intestine. And it, it actually applies also to the esophagus, to the stomach. So uh, the gut is a, is a quite of a kind of a complicated system. So we have the epithelium. So basically it's a one cell uh, layer which uh, separates our body uh, from the lumen, I mean from the bacteria, from the food antigens. And it's surrounded basically by muscle. So muscle can be oriented in the longitudinal and circular uh, uh, fashion. And this is what is moving actually the contents. And the, the coordination is done by the nerves, which we see here, and the nerves actually spread uh, from the esophagus until uh, the rectum. And even if we basically disconnect the brain, the, the gut will be still wor work, it will be able to work on its own. And we have the, the immune system there, and again, if you think about the, 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 the strongest immune system in the body, it's the, the gut, it's the gastrointestinal system, especially the um, the second part, uh, the, the small intestine. And it has been sh clearly shown that uh, any immune activation can affect motility, and it will affect the muscle, and it will affect the nerves. And not speaking, actually, I, I don't have it here, but in, in the stomach and in the small intestine, we have also specialized uh, cells. They are called pacemaker cells, similar to what we have in the heart. And again, these are actually the cells which trigger the signal uh, and trigger the actual contractions. Now, when we think about uh, the gut, we have this uh, layer of epithelium. We have the submucosa, where mainly the immune cells are located. And then we have uh, the muscle. And as I said, it's arranged either longitudinally or in a circular fashion. Now, the, the idea, I mean, behind motility is really to move either the food or in the lower part, it's the, uh, the remnants of food or the, uh, the feces and move it in the coordinated fashion, uh, uh, I mean, downstream. And we can measure it in, in different ways. And this is just an example of uh, motility when we are measuring pressures generated in the esophagus. And you can see that, for example, here, this is the opening into the esophagus. So when we swallow, the muscle in the uh, upper valve will open, and then the food passes into the esophagus. And once it gets in the proximal part, the upper part of the esophagus, it triggers a strong contraction, which is now uh, characterized by the increase in pressure. And this contraction propagates until the stomach. So. Uh, the, the esophagus can generate quite high pressures between 100 and 200 millimeters mercury, and uh, all this is uh, highly coordinated. So there are several ways how we can measure motility. We can just do simple fluoroscopy, so it means we are using X-ray and some uh, contrast material. We can do uh, uh, manometry measurements, and actually. Uh, some patients here uh, in, in the room actually had this, what is called high-resolution esophageal manometry. And there we can see what, uh, uh, what are the changes which are imposed by scleroderma. And I will show some examples. And we can also do scintigraphy. I mean, we can uh, put some radioactive labels in the food and we can measure how quickly it passes through the esophagus. 
how long it stays in the stomach and how it gets uh, actually moved into the small intestine. So this, uh, this is what is called spatial temporal map and this is actually example of uh, measurement in the, in the esophagus and although it looks very complicated it's a, it's a kind of two-dimensional representation of what is happening in the esophagus. So the time actually moves from left to right and we have uh, the esophagus uh, on the, uh, I mean, from top to bottom. Now, the pressure there is uh, uh, color coded. So, when you have this dark blue, that means the, nothing is happening, everything is close to zero. Uh, when the pressure increases, which goes to uh, green, yellow, red, the, the pressures are, uh, are actually higher. And now there are these. Uh, two lines which you can see here and this represents what is called upper and lower esophageal sphincter and these are the two valves on the, on the upper and lower end of the esophagus which always open when we swallow and the food is moved down and then they close again because they have important function they prevent acid from the stomach to enter in the, into the esophagus so we can see that actually uh, when we swallow the upper sphincter opens and then there is a contraction, I mean pressure which is generated by the esophageal muscle and it pushes down uh, the foot. So this is how it looks in a normal individual, in a healthy, uh, healthy person. And this is what happens in patients with advanced scleroderma. So you can see that the upper valve looks normal, if anything it's stronger because it's in, in these red values. But if you have a look here at the bottom, this is where the lower valve, lower esophageal sphincter is, it's very weak, it's kind of between the blue-green. And this is the first place which is actually affected by scleroderma, the, the muscle, the valve, which separates esophagus from the stomach is getting weak and it allows the stomach contents to, to enter the esophagus. And you can see that uh, what is missing here also is the, the peristaltic movement, that the muscle which uh, should be pushing actually the food down towards the stomach, this is, uh, uh, this is absent. And in the next uh, map on the, on the right, you can see kind of the intermediate uh, uh, stage. So there, are, there is still some pressure which is generated by the lower valve and there is some contraction in the, in the esophagus. So what is happening actually in, in scleroderma? So we know, as in other organs, there is inflammation in the muscle wall, and uh, um, there is a deposition of collagen between the, the muscle, between the smooth muscle fibers, and it results in muscle weakness and, and atrophy. And there is a also a possibility that there is a minor damage to the nerve which are supplying and, and innervating the, the esophagus, stomach or, or the bowels. So all this will result in the loss of muscle tone, so the muscle is becoming weak and is not able to induce this peristaltic movement uh, along the gastrointestinal tract. And if we, uh, this, so this is again the scheme of a healthy profile in the, uh, for example, in the small intestine. And this is what is happening uh, during uh, scleroderma. So it, there is this deposition of the muscle. So the, you have less uh, muscle fibers there. They are weaker. And also the deposition of collagen makes the, the intestine a bit more difficult to move uh, than uh, in healthy individuals. So when we look at the, uh, the scleroderma esophagus, or if there is uh, any uh, involvement uh, of, of the gastrointestinal tract, it's most common in, in the esophagus, and it affects between 70 to 80 uh, percent of patients. And usually it's uh, in, uh, in women between age uh, 30 to 50. And the main symptoms will be heartburn, acid regurgitation, and because the, the esophagus cannot move the food down, it will also result in dysphagia, so that means the patients are not able to swallow well. 
And if the, the reflux or the symptoms continue, if it's uh, long standing, uh, there is an additional inflammation and it can uh, result in strictures. That means there is a local narrowing in the, in the esophagus. So how, we, how can we treat it? So there is uh, no single drug which will uh, reverse the, the inflammation or the, the changes in the esophagus. So we have just to, we have to work around it. And what is recommended is uh, smaller but uh, frequent meals for uh, really patients who have significant reflux. Uh, what is important is to have the dinner at least three or four hours before going to bed because once you lay down and you, have, uh, you are in horizontal position, you are likely, more likely to have uh, the stomach uh, contents enter uh, the esophagus. And then to, to avoid uh, certain food triggers. So each of us uh, reacts to certain foods, which are some of them uh, don't go with you, uh, whether it's uh, really spicy foods, whether uh, very often it's uh, uh, something acidic. Uh, it's also known, for example, coffee, alcohol, all this makes uh, the, the reflux symptom worse. We can treat it. We can uh, uh, block, for example, the acid uh, production in the stomach, and we have different classes of medications. So, the most common and most, uh, I mean, the strongest ones are the proton pump inhibitors, and this can be the omeprazole, pariet, nexium, or pantoloc, or a bit weaker one, which we can buy over the counter, and uh, uh, this is ranitid in the class of uh, H2 blockers. So, this is one strategy, and this, is, this means that we are just decreasing the acid in the stomach. But it doesn't deal with the other digestive enzymes or bile, for example, which is coming from the small intestine into the stomach. So in that case, we use, uh, we stimulate motility. So we, we uh, provide drugs which help to empty the stomach. And there are several, domperidone, metoclopramide, and probably the strongest one which we have now, it's resotran. And the, uh, the, the name of the drug actually is uh, procalopride. Although it is not uh, so common, uh, scleral mud can also affect small bowel and, and the colon. And again, the, uh, the mechanism behind is very similar. It's thinning and weakness of the, of the muscle layer. And you can have what is called the decreased intestinal transit. That means the food uh, doesn't move properly within the small intestine and colon. And the symptoms are kind of dyspepsia. Uh, sometimes it can be constipation. But because the, the motility doesn't work properly, sometimes it allows the bacteria from the lower part of the digestive tract migrate to the upper part. And this is what is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the bacteria are known to, to digest whatever we eat. So it's called bacterial fermentation. And if they move to the upper part of the digestive tract, it can cause diarrhea, bloating. And in that case, we, we treat this by uh, uh, antibiotics. With respect to intestinal dysmotility, so if we have patients with constipation, and again, this is uh, quite common in patients with scleroderma, we can provide them the treatment with resotram, which I already mentioned for, uh, for to increase the uh, stomach motility. Or there is a new medication, which is again very safe, very effective. It's called Constella. And this medication actually works on the lining of the gut and makes these cells secrete water uh, to the lumen. So it's basically, uh, it's flushing the lumen from, from inside. So this is just my take home message. So, uh, the function and the structure of the digestive tract uh, is impaired in many patients with uh, scleroderma. The disease causes uh, collagen deposition between muscle fibers, and this leads to the muscle thinning and uh, loss of strength. And esophagus and small intestine are commonly affected. The treatment then relies mainly on lifestyle changes and symptomatic treatment. Uh, for, I mean, most commonly inhibition of acid secretion and stimulation of uh, gastrointestinal motility. And that's all from my, from my part. So thank you for your attention.